Tell him, McCluskey. Tell him what time it is. Little Hand says it's time to rock and roll. All you people are so scared of me. Come quietly or there will be trouble. Man, that's just me. I'm Batman. This is Sparta! There is a tiger in the bathroom. I'm an excellent driver. If it bleeds, we can kill it. Pop quiz, hot shot. Keep the change, you filthy animal. You open the package. All three. Never open the package. Hello and welcome to this week's Monday Movie Show. A little bit delayed due to technical issues, thanks to <coughs> um, the... Uh, Actually, don't say it like that again because it does sound like you just swore. <laughs> well, I didn't actually swear, so it doesn't matter. Um, I know, but it still sounds like you did swear there. Uh, so yeah, I, I could, but, you know, I won't. No, um, but barring any further technical issues, we'll be here with you for the for the next uh, little while going through doing the show as usual. Um, anyone not listening to the show live, it is the 7th of September 2015. We are already in September, isn't it? Isn't it scary how fast this year's gone by? Um, it's my birthday in 18 days' time. <laughs> I shall I shall be sure and remind you of that. Yeah, I'll be uh, drunk out of my brain, so it's a bit, a bit pointless. Either that or on a train. I'm spending about eight nine hours of my birthday on a train. Okay. How do much I, do, fun is that? Do I want to ask why? I'm going all the way down to Southampton, and it's about a four and a half train ride from Sunderland to London, and then it's about a two and a half hour train ride from London to Southampton. That sounds like a fun birthday. Whoopee. <laughs> yeah. Um, if you are listening to us live, you can join us in chat in the bottom right hand corner of your screen on Spreaker. Just little click that little chat icon and you'll be able to send us messages and please be nice. Um, otherwise we will kick you from there. Um <laughs> It's a, it's a bit of a long show because we've got quite a bit coming up on here, so um, why don't you tell them what we've got coming up exactly, Stuart? Yeah, well, in the cinema section, we have the reboot, and I don't know why they're rebooting it to the Transporter series with Transporter Refueled. Sort of like slacker action comedy with American Ultra, uh, drama, me, Earl, and the Dying Girl, and it's round things off thriller with no escape. Yep. Uh, before that, of course, we'll have a bit of news. We'll have a look at the UK box office top ten, and then after that, as usual, we'll go into the home release section, which will include these movies: the final Fast and Furious film to feature Paul Walker, which I watched um, a couple of days ago for the second time, and I cried again. So it just shows you how much impactful it is. With Fast and Furious Seven, Skype Horror, brilliant time to actually do a yeah. movie like this, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it was rather convenient for this evening, wasn't it? See, see the we, thing actually, the, the thing that was really scary when I was having problems earlier with it, uh, there was actually a knock behind me. Okay. <laughs> oh, well, that's with Unfriended then. A very <laughs> weird little thriller with Final Girl, and then you've got action movie, The Forger, horror film from producer James Wan with Demonic, so James Wan is appearing for a second time. And to round things off, we have a Royal Night Out. Not actually yep. literally a Royal Night Out, but the film A Royal Night Out. Yeah, you can imagine if we were actually literally going out on a roll night out and doing the show. That wouldn't end Get, well, would it? Having a knees up with the Queen. Uh, yeah, they, just, just just roll on. You, you, yeah, you you didn't think about that before you said it, did you? It just, just you, roll as on. As soon as you heard it, yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's go on to the first thing then, uh, quickly with some news before we, we end up making some, making some news. Um, first bit of news, that I've only got one this evening, but you've got a whole load, so I'll just get mine out of the way. Paramount has released um, a date for the sequel to Jack Reacher. Uh, the movie is still currently just titled Jack Reacher 2. Um, has been given a release date of October 1st, 2016. The first movie, which was not a, a massive success, has gained enough um, sort of momentum on DVD and Blu-ray that it's then going ahead with having a second film. Um, and so with this case, um, you're going to get directing it is Ed Zweig, who worked with Tom Cruise on The Last Samurai. Um, the first movie was based on the novel One Shot. This one will be based on the novel Never Go Back, uh, again written by Lee Childs. Yeah, I didn't like the last Jack Reacher film, so that I, to be honest, I don't care. I, I did, I did enjoy the Jack Reacher film, and I really enjoyed it because I liked it's. It's a very, it's a very realistic film. It's very grounded in realism. I think the way it's shot and the way it's done, but it's very cleverly. It's, it's a film that if you go back and watch it again. There is more in it for you to get because it's it's filled with all these kind of 
flashback scenes which aren't actually flashbacks it's in the character's head how they're viewing things so you're seeing things slightly different each time and I really love that about it I, there's loads of things that every time I've watched it and I've watched it numerous times there's always been something extra I go oh hang on a minute I didn't see that before um, and I'm really pleased with that I'm, I'm looking forward to this I got I gotta wonder I think the reason that Paramount is letting Tom Cruise do more Jack Reacher films it's probably because of the fact they want to keep him sweet with him because of Mission Impossible being so good and so so well received and successful financially that they're probably willing to let him make a, a film that even though the first one wasn't a massive success, it still made money. Yeah, like I said, I, I to, to be honest, I still don't care. So uh, Jack Reacher 2, that's yours. You, you yeah, can gladly so review that. Gladly, happily. Yep, uh, well, I've got multiple pieces of news, including uh, I'd like to try and trek out or seek out a piece of news that technically isn't fully news, but it is a bit weird and strange. So I'll leave that okay. until the end. But um, according to The Hollywood Reporter, Brad Bird's Tomorrowland is 2015 biggest flop of the year so far. The film's budget really? was uh, yeah was around $190 million, which needs to be doubled because of uh, promotional costs, um, Things like that, so it is around about three hundred and eighty million, and so the film looks like it will lose around about one hundred and twenty to one hundred and fifty million dollars. Uh, other films in the top five included Fantastic Four, mm. which is at number two with a loss of around about eighty to one hundred million, and Pixels at number three with a loss of around about seventy-five million. Okay, because I was going to say Fantastic Four, I would have thought has lost more money than that. Nope, it is Tomorrowland, which is, to be honest, Disney are not having, they, they have the highs and they have their major lows, because the, look at the, what happened with the Lone Ranger as well. That was a big loss for them. So they, again, they, not a bad film. I, I really enjoyed Tomorrowland and I really enjoyed the Lone Ranger. It, it's just, Disney don't mind taking chances, but they take chances on movies which cost a hell of a lot of money. <laughs> it's sort of like studios giving the Wachowskis money. None of their films <laughs> after... <laughs> after um, any of the, the Matrix movies has actually brought in money for the studios and so they should actually realise this and I know it's stifling creativity and uh, something a bit unique but it's a really difficult thing to actually balance now. Actually saying that about the Wachowskis, is Jupiter Ascending on that list, do you know? Um, was Jupiter Ascending 2015? It, it was released in 2015 because it was pushed back to 2015. It didn't come out until uh, March or April. But it was supposed to be last year, and they, they pushed the release date back, I think, because they had special effects works that had to be finished on it. We'll, we'll find out at the end of the year, because it was only the top five that was released. Uh, and um, like I said, it was Tomorrowland, which was number one. So at the end of the year, probably keep an eye out on uh, the website, mondaymoveshow.co.uk, because I sometimes do like the top ten films of the year, like the highest grossing films of the year, and right near to the end of the year probably maybe even in early january and also the worst taking films of the year so you never know it did it, it could tomorrowland could make some money back from dvd sales which might reduce it down a little bit the deficit yeah. down so because it's yet to be released on dvd and blu-ray i think it might actually do really well on dvd and blu-ray because I, th I think it's a film that it's one of those ones that people will get for the kids and kids will sit through it and enjoy it and parents can actually sit with their kids and enjoy it as well it's not a, it's not a film that you put on for your kids and you go their kids just sit there for a couple of hours and watch this it's actually a film that if parents haven't seen it they could put on they'll go right kids sit there and watch that for a couple of minutes and they go oh hang on a minute what's this and sit down and end up watching it with the kids and it's a family film maybe we'll, we'll see like i said we'll see at the end of the year um, the Tracking Board are reporting that Nickelodeon is planning to bring some of their famous franchises together in an Avengers-esque movie titled Nicktoons, even though they've got a channel called Nicktoons. Uh, childhood favourites, He Arnold, Rugrats and Ren and Stimpy, which when I looked at the list, that's the weirdest ones to throw in there, are set to team up against an ultimate evil bad guy. Okay. Um, none of them nostalgia nothing no, nothing you didn't watch the Rugrats you didn't watch nope, Ren and didn't Stimpy watch nope I know Ren and Stimpy but I never watched them how dare you Ren and Stimpy was awesome but if you, uh, you you know what Ren and Stimpy are like of characters and they are completely nuts and insane Stimpy you idiot 
Exactly. Mixing them with Rugrats. Hmm. Well, that can be one that you'll do then. When... <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I get animated films pretty much first come first, <laughs> so, so we'll, we'll see. Um, Capcom have announced that Mega Man is getting his own movie. Mm, okay, he's had how many? 15 different games, so. More than why that. Not? <laughs> um, it, it, it's questionable. It's part of the new. Remember last week I uh, did the piece of news regarding Nintendo going back into the movie making industry? It's as part well, of it's, part, it's okay. part of this deal. So, by the looks of things, the Mega Man film might be the first uh, movie under that deal. It was sort of like predicted it might be a new Super Mario Brothers movie. But there they're going with uh, Mega Man. So, um, Selena Gomez has joined the cast of Bad Neighbors 2. So, there's a Bad Neighbors 2. Yes, there is a Bad Neighbors 2. And yes, Seth Rogen is going to be in it. And Zach Efron is going to be in it as well. Can somebody open that door? Sorry, no, that's not a door. That's my head on the table. Um, according to C- Superhero Hype, the Hulk has been cut out of the next Captain America film because his comeback story was too big. I heard about this and I don't think it's a bad idea because I think that um, the next Captain America film is going to be too packed with so many people in it. I'm really looking forward to it, but I think that I don't think necessarily they had to cut him out. But I think obviously because of the way his character left in the last film in, in Age of Ultron, you had him leaving in a certain way, he's going to need more screen time to really show how that comes back from that. So, yeah. And if you look at the amount of characters that's going to be in the next Captain America film, it's insane. Yeah. It's Marvel is going big. They really are going big. And it's, I think it's going to pay off because I think that, I mean, it's the, the you and I have issues on the films, but for me, Captain America Winter Soldier which was directed by the Russo brothers um, has been directed by them again now is my favourite of the Marvel films and so I'm gladly looking forward to more of them doing it and what they're going to do with this story I'm looking forward it's to just, it to really see what it's going to be like to me it, it's just a precursor to the next um, Avengers film that, that's all it is because the next Avengers film uh, the Infinity War one is going to be directed by the Russo brothers as well and so the amount of characters that's going to be in the next Captain America film gives you an indication if they can actually handle huge, massive characters, the loads of them. And it's insane the amount of characters that's going to be in it. So that's my worry. The fact that there is too many characters and so there's too much for them to concentrate on. It might be a mess. Yeah, well, so, there is that. I mean, you had the previously there have been films in the Marvel films which set up the the next Avengers. So they're, because they're connected, so it, that's going to happen. We'll see, but I think it's going to be a mess. Um, Danny Boyle has confirmed that his next project will be the sequel to the nineteen ninety six film Tree and Spotten. Hmm. Okay, I could go for that. I just, I'm. I'm curious where they're going to go because from what I I've not read the books uh, but I know there is a book and I think there was not something about the book was something in it wouldn't work if they did it now so they'd have to change it and change it quite radically from what the book did in order to make it work so I can't remember what it was because it was a while ago so if that's true though it'd be interesting to see what they come up with but they're not going to be if they're not following the book who knows you know how that could work out yeah, it's going to be a weird one. It, won't this be Danny Boyle's first sequel? Uh, uh, did he do... He didn't do 48 Days Later, did he? No, 28 Weeks Later. 28, 28 Weeks Later, sorry. 28, 28, no, he 20. didn't. That There was one Carlos for his Oh, law. yes, it was. So, I mean, I'm surprised, actually, they, they haven't done 48 Months Later. Sorry, 48, 28 Months Later. Because they... They were talking about doing that, weren't they? There, there, they just... there, there is still plans for that to happen, but this might actually be... I know it's not like technically a sequel to Trainspotting, mm. but it, it follows on from the story, so it's not like Trainspotting 2. Yeah. But it might be the first proper sequel that he might have done. Interesting. Yeah, and the um, couple of pieces of... Well, one piece of small news is that Sam Smith is practically confirmed to be doing the Spectre theme tune. Yay, another boring person doing another James Bond thing tune, whoopee. Sam Smith, Sam Smith. Yeah, he's the drawling voice guy. He's sort of like the female, the male version, female version, 
female and male version of Adele. I was hoping it would be Elliot Gould, Elliot, Elliot Gould, um, Ellie Goulding, because I actually do like Ellie Goulding. I think she's got a fantastic voice. She yeah, she got, did uh, Fifty Shades of Grey, though. Yeah, I was, no, she didn't do Fifty Shades of Grey. She did a song that was used in Fifty Shades of Grey. It wasn't the theme. It was a song used in the soundtrack. That's a different. Which actually, <laughs> which actually interleaved bits from the movie into the the video that was shot for the song itself. Yeah, well, I mean, so it, that's it down was the main the song for the film, and it was actually used in the film. That's down, yeah, it was used in the film, but the music for it is basically it's down to the composer that composes the musical score for the film. And in particular, if you want to go about that, go back to look at um, Baz Luhrmann's The Great Gatsby, which the music was done by um, Christopher Young, and the music though used Lana Del Rey's song in it, and it really did use it. It mixed it in with the score, and it, he had it, he composed loads of bits using her music, and that's how it works. And it's that's a fantastic one. That's a great musical score that yeah, uses the song. But we, we I, weren't talking about scores; no. we're talking about soundtracks. And Sam yes. Smith is going to be doing the soundtrack, and Adele did the soundtrack to the last Bond film. Ellie Golden did the soundtrack to Fifty Shades of Grey as well. So it, it's soundtracks that we're talking about because she was on yeah, the soundtrack, not did the. Soundtrack. Yeah, fine. She was on the soundtrack, but but still though, the the theme tune opened up the last Bond film, and it was droll and dross and boring as hell, which mm. sort of like fell in line with Skyfall. So Sam Smith is going to mourn over the opening credits of um, of Spectre, and it, it's just yeah, it's not my kind of mu uh, mu uh, music at all. <laughs> but he's still got a really great and an annoying whiny voice. All he sings about is love and people leaving him. No the wonder if you got a mob like that. Um, the only other sort of like piece of news, but like I said, it's non piece of news. It's a bit weird. You know the film Blade, don't you? With uh, Wesley Snipes. Yes, and yeah. you know one of the the famous rave scene, which involves a lot yeah. of people inside of a club and lots of blood getting splattered on them. Yeah. Now that's been replicated a few times, um, Halloween nights and stuff like that. Well, the club in Amsterdam are going one step further. They are fully going to replicate it with real blood. No. Yes, on October the 31st, a club in Amsterdam is going to shower its people at the, uh, on the dance floor with real blood from sprinklers above them. Surely that can't be, uh, well, legal. I mean, it's, that's going to be, that's a biohazard thing. It's Amsterdam for you. That's just wrong. It, it's just, yeah, that, it's just really weird. If it's, if it's like fake blood, you know, you know, fake drink blood, you know, that you can get for that, then yeah, but real, no, that's that cannot be happening. Yeah. <sighs> no. it, it is going to be, it is going to happen. But on that note, we'll move over to the UK box yeah. office top 10 the night. Yeah. And it's on uh, number... Back. And number 10 is in you went for 45 years. Uh, which I actually have nothing about. <laughs> yeah, um, all I can direct you to is Mark Kermode on his uh, YouTube channel because he reviewed the film and he seemed to really like it. So if you want to listen to a review of that, listen to his YouTube channel. He's, it's on there. I'm somewhere. actually looking at the details for it and I can actually see nothing about it. <laughs> it all I know, it's about an old couple, the male part of the couple... He gets note of a girlfriend that was part of an avalanche or she was involved in an avalanche 50 years prior. Um, that body is found uh, in, in really good condition as well. And he's celebrating his 45th anniversary and so these secrets start to unravel. Hmm. I think okay. that's it. It sounds really intriguing. Um, and number nine is Minions. <laughs> Which you're not going to believe I still haven't seen yet despite having seen all this week's films and also catching up on another film which isn't in the top 10 or even the top 15 yeah which is the gift and what did um, you think of it i gotta say actually i really enjoyed it i thought it was very very warped very very disturbing at times film but a very good kind of genre twister as it really twisted that the the thriller genre on its head um, and I was really impressed with it, and I I was quite honestly surprised. Didn't expect it, and it was really good. Uh, very good directorial hand, de debut, it is, isn't it? Yeah, very good, especially for directing and acting in it as well from George and having written it too. 
Um, yeah. But going back to Minions, I haven't seen, which is the one I probably will see it next now this week, and then it'll be out of the top ten next week. Yeah, because it's out on Blu-ray and DVD on the second of November. So there you go. At yeah. number eight is last week's number one, Paper Towns. Which I did honestly try to get and see because I really do want to see it. Surprising how much it's dropped down, but that is, again, because of the whole thing of it getting released on a Monday, so it kind of had an over and a fake inflated takings for the week, which jumped it up to number one. Um, I still haven't seen it. I really do want to see it, and it looks very kind of similar teen drama thing to one of the films that we're reviewing later on. Um, yeah. but I haven't seen it but I, I do really want to see it it does look good it does look interesting a drop off of 78.6% which is yeah. humongous that and number 7 is Sinister 2 which is your territory yeah leave Bagul to rest because Bagul was th- threatening in the first one you need to actually see it like that it adds more threatening to, to his name but yeah Bagul is really bad in the, the sequel the whole it film is just like pretty a, it sounded like like uh, Scooby Doo, there. Yeah, I'm not doing the Scooby Doo impression. Trust me. But yeah, it, it's just it shows you how bad the uh, the film is. If they take a character that that's barely in the first one and make him the lead character, and only have his name as Deputy So and So, they didn't even bother giving him a name. Poor guy. And number six is the Man from Uncle or U dot N dot C dot L dot E dot. Yeah. Which I. What does that stand for? It is United Nations. Um, I can't remember what it is exactly. And you, and if you're watching the film, because it's it's all about how Uncle is put together, you don't find it out until right at the very end. It's literally the start of the end credits that explains that what it is. Um, I've always wanted to know what it stood for because I, I used to watch the TV series uh, as a kid, and I obviously as a kid I wasn't paying much attention to it because it was the parents who was watching it. But I never knew what Uncle stood for. It's, it's like something it. like it's something like United Nations something something and something. It's I can't remember. It's like a it's like a United Nations threat sort of assessment thing or something. I, yeah. I honestly can't remember. I can look it up, but I'm not going to. Um, but I, I will do that while you're on about it. Okay, it's a it's a film that surprised me because the fact of the when I saw it, I saw it with a, a and a half empty screen. It was really not busy at all, and the audience it didn't really play to, and that kind of did affect my viewing of it but since then I have found myself thinking you know what I'd like to see it again and there's bits in it that I really liked there's stuff, some stuff that I really did enjoy it does a, it is a film that the first hour of it really did take a long time to get going for me and then the last hour is when it kind of starts to ramp up things and get better but I have to say that I I as much as I did have that feeling for it I still have issues with it I think that it's not the best cast in it I think that it's not written especially well for Alicia Vikander's character um, and I don't think it is among the among the best of what Guy Ritchie is, is capable of doing as a director and it's the fifth fifth biggest flop of the year Man from Uncle and it's Uncle Stan they're still in the US box, this box office as well I think at the top ten yeah Ooh. Uncle stands for United Network Command for Law and Enforcement ah okay I had one and the- right. There was a girl from Uncle as well. Hmm. Really? I did not know that. I didn't know that. <laughs> uh, number five is Pixels. Which is 20 years old, and even though it only just came out, it's 20 years old because the jokes in it are from the 90s, the games in it are from the 90s, the Adam Sandler performances in it from the 90s, and it's just really... It's, it's a slight step up for Adam Sandler, but it's a huge drop down for Christopher Columbus as a director. Yeah, it's. I would say it, it's a big, huge, massive step up from The Cobbler, which was released two weeks prior to this, because you, you've yet to see that. And it'll be no, interesting. I but it's, it's definitely a massive step up as well from Jack and Jill, which was his last. Anything could film. be a step up from that. So it, it, it's obvious, but it's still. The Cobbler. No, God. Um, <laughs> that's really difficult. That's, a good that question. that's the why. The Cobbler or Jack and Jill? I, I would like you to watch The Cobbler because. I wonder if it'll make you as angry as it made me angry because <laughs> it, it's I hate manipulative movies. Jack and Jill's just annoying, really annoying. But yeah, the pixels. The at least it's got a, a plus in the fact that the CGI is fine. It is. It is a visually good film, and it does have some jokes in there that do work. 
I mean, it's not like another film which didn't even... It's not even in the top 10. It's, it's at number 14, um, which is Vacation, which I laughed at once. I did, I have to admit, I did laugh at Pixels. It wasn't brilliant, but it did make me laugh. Yeah, at number four is Mission Impossible Rogue Nation. Most successful of the franchise. In our opinion, not the best. That was the last one, but it's a close second. It's a good film. It's solid. It's not a fantastic film, but it's it's well put together, and it's... It's more of the same, which is fun and enjoyable, and you can go along with it. Ad number three is the new entry for Hitman Agent Forty Seven, which is not brilliant. It's got some. It's got some. It deserves some plaudits for some of the action. That's about it, though. the The performances in it are really bad. Some of the dialogue in it is even worse, and it's got a story that really is just made up for the sake of oh, we need the character to do something. Let's do this. Which is pretty much you can do. You can attest every single thing in the whole the whole film to that, and it's not even really Hitman. Again, they've just taken the title and the character and gone. Oh, we'll do our own thing, which isn't what you do when you adapt. You don't adapt a book and just go. Oh, here's the character's name. Here's the thing. We'll just won't bother. You take a story from it and you follow the story. You do things that are in it. Don't just make crap up. Yeah, Rupert friend. I, I, he did not suit it. Um, if you noticed, also he had hair. Now, Agent 47 is completely bald. Timothy Oliphant managed to pull that off really well back in 2007. How comes it's taken them eight years and they've given, given um, Agent 47 a hair? And Zachary Quinto is also is completely miscast in the movie. So he, he hasn't a clue what, what he's actually doing. It's, it's a mess. I much prefer the first Hitman film, even though that wasn't very well made. It still had elements which reminded you of the game. This one just reminded you of some kind of knockoff version of Hitman. It's one of these films that, um, like a film we're about to go into in a minute, uh, literally has the feel of uh, written by Luke Besson, should be there somewhere. Yeah. At number two, I really hope it's not Inside Out you're talking about. Imagine Luke Besson no. directing a Pixar film. Oh, well, I haven't seen it, but he did do a kid's film, didn't he? He did the Micmax or something, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that um, would be a head trip for you. Yeah, and also Arthur and the Invisibles or something, I can't remember. But, um, no, That's again, awful, that film. Again, Inside Out is one I haven't seen. It's, it's the two big things, animation ones, and I haven't had a chance to see them. So I, just, I didn't get a chance to see them opening week and not, not had a chance yet to go back to them. Well, you've got a better chance of actually seeing Inside Out than you have a Minions, <laughs> so at least that is, because Inside oh, Out is oh, still... Oh, Minions is going to be on... You know Minions is going to be showing on Saturday mornings in cinemas for kids' showings for like the next year. Well, can you be bothered to go and see a kid's showing of Minions? <laughs> no, not a good idea. Uh, but yeah, Inside Out is, is still taking more than a million pounds at the UK box office. So it's it's doing fantastic for itself. It's another small drop-off of only 14%. Last week, it was a drop-off of 12%. The week before that, 3%. So the, the drop-offs are not very big on it. And people are flocking to see it. And I'm glad because it is Pixar at their best. And at number one, and you had entry for Straight Outta Compton. Which I didn't like or love. I, d I didn't really especially... I didn't hate it. Um, I think it's it's a worthy sort of adaptation of a true story. But I think there are things in there which, as much as I don't know the true story, that scream to me that they've been fabricated or, you know, they've been told a certain way to admit the truth or to make, a, you know, put a certain point across. And the whole thing of it for me that just doesn't connect with me because it's rap I don't like rap I don't like rap music at all it's not my thing so it doesn't it didn't click with me as I think it did with a lot of people but I mean I could see it was doing well when I saw it in showings and it was it was on busy had a lot of people going to it so fair enough people are going to see it because they have they're either fans of um, NWA or they enjoy rap music or they get something out of it but for me just didn't work I've yet to see it um, I haven't been able to find two and a half hours to go and see it. And unfortunately, yeah. this week, there is a couple of films I definitely want to go and see at the uh, at the cinema. So I'm not sure I'll be able to get around to watching Straight Outta Compton. Um, well, we'll see. It'll probably be one of those films for me, like with you with Inside Out or Minions, that it's going to take a little while for me to actually get to see it. I, I want to see it, even though I'm not a fan of rap music. I just want to see it to see how it portrays them. And from word of mouth, what I've been getting, it is a really good film. So it, just to see where, where it lies, whether it is, I agree with you or whether I agree with a few friends who've seen the film and they really liked it. So, well, we'll see. 
I'll eventually get to see it. But anyway, that is the UK box office top 10 with Straight Out of Compton at number one. So moving on to this week's releases, uh, go on to The Transporter Refueled, which is directed by Camille Delamar. Um, it is the first Transporter film to not star Jason Statham in the role. Um, it is instead star- starring Ed Screen. Um, it is coming after there's been the transport of three films you had with jason statham then you had a transport of tv series with someone else in it which was a uh, really quite panned by just about everyone um and then this has come along as kind of a a reboot continuation of the series here you have the the character who is the usual thing you know he's got this whole thing of the rules of you know you, you have a package you have to wait for it and everything you have him turn up there for to be there at a certain time and then he'll drive it to where he's got to go and that's the deal um the things get a bit more complicated in this case where he's uh does the job picks up a woman at a bank which then turns out there are three women um they've turned up they've robbed the bank he drives off gets them away um and then finds out that he has to actually do a couple more jobs to them even though that's not the deal because of the fact of that they have kidnapped and poisoned his father played by Ray, Ray Stevenson here's a clip all in all, it's not the worst way to go. Excuse me, but now we're partners, maybe you can tell me what this is all about. You do what we ask. I think you will find that the more you venture, the more you will gain. Quitting Alexander Dumas? Like what? You are Count D'Artagnan and they're the Three Musketeers. You've read it. In fact, my favorite line is, I'm sure you're very nice. You'd be nicer if you left me alone. No deal, Junior. Zip me up. Mm. Don't look so sad. In 24 hours, this will all be over. And once you understand what we're up to, you might even like it. So, there's this whole thing going on that there there are these reasons why these women are doing these bank robberies. They're all connected to something to do with a a sort of trafficker. And it also has connection to Frank's past, the, the transporter's past. Um, but the problem is that really it's well as we said about earlier on there are films that have written by Luc Besson sort of planted all over them this literally does have written by Luc Besson because he was involved in writing it though he didn't direct it it's been produced by his company he's basically been have a hand in it and it's got that kind of that European Luc Besson look and feel to it that you get with Luc Besson effective films unless he's directed it because he's a good he's a really good director it turns out as this kind of Euro trash film and that's what it is. It's it's not brilliant, it's not good and it's got some nice little moments in the in the car chases. Um but it really is sort of scraping the bottom of the barrel now. There's there's this whole thing as well of the um Ed Screen is not Jason Statham. He does not have the screen presence and the charisma of him. He does not have he doesn't hold the screen at all i think ray stevenson's been put in there as an addition to to make it basically so that there is someone else there to try and pass off that charisma and that charm a bit because he actually has a little bit in there I, i'm not a massive fan of his for a lot of things he's done but i thought he was actually better in this than he's been in anything else and he's definitely better than edge screen and i just honestly sat there wondering you know why why do this you don't need to it's probably going to make some money because i i don't expect it's got a massive budget and it's not going to be a big massive load of money but because it's a european thing it's probably going to do okay and we'll probably get another transporter film which we don't need because we need one about as much as we needed this so by the indication is it was pointless sort of like rebooting it um do you think that they should have learned their lesson from the tv series I think that they basically decided, oh, the TV series was okay. The TV series wasn't okay. The TV series was terrible. And saying that, this is better than the TV series, but only because of the fact of that once you get through the end of it, it's done. You haven't got another 12 episodes of it to go through. You know, it, it, it's really annoying. You're probably hoping that it, it is a series that should just like, disappear. Because by the sounds of it, uh, I've not watched any of the Transport films, but... It seems like Jason Statham is sort of like a key point when it comes to the transport of films. I've seen bits and bobs, but I haven't actually sat down through a whole entire film. But he seems to be the key ele- element of it. Well, so it when is, you I mean, take that key element away, you're sort of like lacking the main important thing with the series. Yeah, well, the first one is is a really good sort of... It was a really good Jason Statham vehicle. 
um, it did propel him a bit and you know his his star status and all and it's got really nicely choreographed stuff it's really well shot and directed I can't actually think if it was Luke Besson who directed it I don't think it was I think it was someone else um, and I don't think he's ever directed any of the Transporter films the second one is terrible even though it's got Jason Statham in it to elevate it a little bit, but it's a terrible film. The third one is better, and it has this little thing of a that he's got this kind of bomb around his neck that if he doesn't stay with his car for so long, then he'll die. Um, and it has that little sort of plot twist to keep it going. Um, but this is this is just it's it's seriously just dropping down worse and worse each time. And if they make another one, it's just going to be even worse than this, unless they can do something really really good it's going to be just again it's this typical it's like that what was what was that other one that was the one that was directed by mcg because that was luke besson written was it not and produced oh it's that the one that three days to kill no no there were the other one was christian yeah uh three days to kill with uh kevin costner that was luke besson written and produced i'm sure and it's it's the same kind of level as that it's just awful uh, Louis Leterrier was the one who directed the first two Transporter films who went on to do the incredible whole Clash of the Titans and Now You See Me. Yeah, and if the second one isn't good, but the first one's really good, then he's it's, it's a decent director. I'm not sure, who, I have no idea who did the third one, but the third one was actually a step up from the first two, but this is definitely a step down. Okay, then I'm not seeing it. Like I said, it's a bit pointless me um, seeing a series that I've not even tried to watch, so... Plenty, it has, of, plenty of chances on DVD and Blu-ray to catch up with the other three before you see this one when it comes out on DVD and Blu-ray. No chance. Um, American Ultra is up next. It's written by Max Landis, who wrote Chronicles. So he's got sort of like... He likes to write edgy kind of teen films. Directed by Nima Nurezadeh. I'd probably kill his name, but who cares? It's the guy who directed Project X. So that gives uh, you a clue of what American Ultra yeah. might actually be like. Now, this one, <coughs> get a cough out of the way with. It, it stars uh, Jesse Eisenberg, who's used to sort of like playing these like a kind of characters. And in the film, he plays um, Mike, who works at a convenience store. He likes to get high. He has a penchant for drawing, especially this monkey that goes into space. When you see some of the, the creations that he, he's done with the monkey uh, later on in the film, it's actually really well done. And I wonder if he could actually draw like that, or they've gotten somebody to do that. And I'm sort of eager to see uh, like a little mini, like Weber Sword spin-off from it. Maybe seen an animated version of that monkey because it, it sounded interesting when he was describing it. But yeah, like like I said, he spends most of his time uh, when he's not with his girlfriend in the film, who's played by Kristen Stewart. He, he's he's at sort of like um, the the mart that he works at, or getting high, or trying to find a way of proposing to his girlfriend because he's got this. This phobia where he will not leave the town where he's in. As soon as he steps out of this town, he starts to regret it, get panic attacks, vomit. Prime example is a scene earlier on in the film where he, he's going to propose to his girlfriend and they get to the airport and he ends off panicking. Panicking so much, he vomits in the toilet and they have to come back. And so you can see how their relationship blossoms. He tries to get help from a, a friend who's played by John Leguizamo, who plays Rose brilliant title for a male character um but yeah his life is very much like a kind of life until one day somebody comes into the store where he works and starts babbling this weird gobbledygook to him and he's wondering what what's going on she ends off leaving he thinks it's just a bit of a kook then all of a sudden somebody decides to tamper with his car outside and he just goes completely potty, he goes mad, he's able to kill people brilliantly with spoons and with pot noodles and he has to call his girlfriend to calm himself down. Here's a clip. Hey babes, what's up? Hey, I just killed two people. Two, um, two <laughs> gentlemen. <laughs> That's awesome. Why? No, these two guys were trying to like break into my car at work and they had guns and knives and they were being like total dicks and they just attacked me. Babe, you got mugged? And then I took like a spoon and I just like... Mm, I like shoved it through this guy. Did you call the police? No, I didn't call the police because I'm the kill guy. I'm the murderer, okay? I also have like, I have like a lot of weed and like mushrooms in my car and I just killed two dudes in a parking lot, okay? And Phoebe, if you don't come here right now, I'm just going to start like in my pants. I swear to God, Phoebe, I'm just going to start like How the did this happen? I shot those guys in the head. And that guy, I like, I spooned him in the neck and his just like ended. Why are people trying to stab you? I don't know. Shh. I don't know, but I am. 
I'm like freaking out all over the place, babe. I have like a lot of anxiety about this. Get your hands in the air. Oh, f me. I'm sorry. Drop it. Now, if you think that's bad for Mike, ultimately things are going to get much, 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 much worse because a government sort of like guy who thinks that he's high up, played by Topher Grace, is out to kill him and the program that Mike has been involved with. <coughs> Sorry. Well, and that's the crux of the film. And then after that, it just goes into like 11. And the volume gets turned up to 11. It tries to be a lot like, in a way, have feels like uh, Scott Pilgrim versus the world, have that manic kind of feel. It, it, it's on fast forward constantly. The problem is, though, the direction. It, it's fine with the acting. Both Jesse Eisenberg and Kristen Stewart are fine with the characters that, that they're given. Topher Grace embraces the sort of like moronic guy who thinks that he's high, uh, high up and above everybody else and abuses power that he thinks he has when we know that he doesn't. Uh, John Lake was more has fun every now and again with his character of Rose. It's just how the film di is directed. And from a director who created Project X, all he wanted to do was make an 88-minute party. That's all he did. All he wants to do here is just take, take an action movie, stick it on fast forward, and speed through the entirety of the movie. And you'll just get bored of it, to be honest. It, it was a movie which, which should have had a feel of Scott Pilgrim vs. The World, or films like that. But instead, it just makes you scratch your head, go, can you just end? Because I, I just don't want to be watching this film. I don't want to be in the presence of these characters. I don't, want, I don't like the way you're directing the movie. I don't like the way you're shooting the movie. I don't like anything you're doing with the film, which is annoying because I think the film would have been much better if it was in better hands. I, I kind of agree because I, I think that there was a lot of potential here for it. I thought that there was a lot of potential for it to be really ironically funny and it's not it tries to be at times and it sometimes manages to pull it off a lot of the time you're sitting there and you're thinking I should be laughing at this I should be having any kind of reaction to this other than sitting there and feeling like wow this is just not happening nothing's going on it, it literally at, 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 at points for a film which has explosions and gunshots and things like that and sequences where these guys you know stabbing each other with spoons it's a film that has lots of moments in it where it literally is like it has no pulse and you kind of wonder what's going on with that it's it's a thing of that it's i mean at times i want it to be i was thinking i want this to be something like tremors i want it to be something that's deadly serious but at the same time is able to be really poking fun at things and having things in it which just ironically make you laugh and be funny and be spoofy and be goofy and it feels like it wants to be like that but that whoever is doing it and in charge of it doesn't realize that and isn't able to do that and it wasn't able to bring that to the screen and that's a shame because it is it is really nicely written. It's got some great setups for things. It's got stupid things that happen in it. It's got some interesting characters. It's got some even interesting bad guys. And I'm not, I'm not just talking about the Topher Grace character. I'm talking about there's um, there's uh, these sort of hitman assassins that have been sent after them to kill them. And one of them is called uh, Laugher um, because he because he's a guy who's always laughing and it's a weird thing it's a it's a role though that is really played with relish i can't remember the name of the actor um but it's it's him that's he and he brings it to life and it's not just a sort of typical second rate character it's actually a character that's ridiculous it's like something out of a really bad bond film but at the same time you go with it and you go you know what i can buy that it works for it it's just a thing of the the tone and the decisions that have been made when it's being made and the styling of it are really not successful there's a scene towards the end where there's a big shootout inside a shopping center and i was going through that and i'm thinking you know this should be like hot fuzz there should be bits in there that are really action-packed and it should be funny as well and there's bits in it where you're kind of watching it and there's you know there's, there's deaths a certain way but i i really wanted to see some oddly humorous and I, this may just be kind of like sick sense of humour, but the things I was expecting from it was kind of just interesting ways to kill someone in a shop, in a shopping, you know, in a shop using shopping equipment, using shopping things, not just you know throw a can at them and hit them in the head with it. It's you know be inventive, be ridiculous, and show stuff like that because that's how you kind of make an impression. That's how you make a mark, and it doesn't. 
sort of like have the sort of church scene feel in um, Kingsman. Oh yeah, if you, I mean, it's kind of like if you cross Jason Bourne with that. It's yeah, but also then, I mean, well, then that's that's violently shocking, humorous that kind of way. But to have, I mean, sequences throughout the film where you have stoners there, you know, there's there's this whole thing about them getting high on stuff. You could have really played that up well. You could have had something really really messed up, and it would have been funny if you knew if you knew how to handle it. And the director, unfortunately, you're right, doesn't. Yeah, it, Max Anderson's script. I agree with you. It it, has, it it pops. It would have been like I said. It would have been a much better film if it was in the guise of somebody else. If it was directed by somebody else, because there's potential here. The guy who you're uh, wondering, by the way, who plays Laffer, he's got a brilliant name. His name is Walton Goggins, hmm. which is I mean, freaking seen fantastic. In, seen him in other films before. I mean, he was in Predator. Seen him in the TV yeah. series. Um, uh, I can't remember it. Un. un unjustified justified justifiable I just I can't remember about that one justified justified yeah um and he's a good actor and he's given a role here which actually really works for him and it's it's a weird role and it's good but it's just it's unfortunately just wasted the whole thing is wasted it's not it's not bad it's just you come out of it and you go why did I not enjoy that as much as I should have yep uh go okay going on to uh me and Earl and the dying girl which is based on a novel by Jesse Andrews, who's also written the script. Um, it's directed by Alfonso Gomez Rijon. It is a drama that follows uh, the character of uh, Greg, who's played by Thomas Mann, um, who is a uh, teenager at the, coming towards sort of the end of school, he's getting ready for college, potentially coming up in the next year or so. He is um, sort of this. Uh, as we're told in this voiceover at the start he has kind of figured out this way to survive going through school without joining any of the cliques that are there the groups that are there he's not friends with anyone in particular in there he's just basically in with these you know he's the guy that walks around and says stuff to everyone and everyone just accepts him and he moves on it's not you know they he hangs out with anyone in particular except for this boy named Earl which is explained later the two of them um, have this kind of project you'll hear about in just a moment in the clip um, his mother on the other though sort of hears about one of her friends who's got a, a daughter who has been diagnosed with leukemia um, she thinks that obviously that this girl is going to need some support, going to need a friend, and so of course she decides she's going to um, sort of well force her son to go over there and see her and be her friend. Here's a clip. Mom, what are you doing? Okay, mom, listen. She doesn't want to see me. I'm sorry to be the one to tell you, Gregory, yeah, that you do not have a choice in this particular mom, matter. Please, just let me see one thing. Given for an one opportunity oh my God! Please just let me say one thing. Mom, life, and if what you're choosing instead of that is to lie around you know, the house all day like a dead see me. slug, then I will be we're required to step in mom, we're not and even inform friends. you that that is 100 percent oh unacceptable. Your non-stop stream of words is making me freak out. And if you think that all these excuses you're making are in any way better or more important than the happiness. Of a girl with cancer, now a friend with cancer. You are sadly mistaken, my friend. You are going to pick up that phone. You are going to call Rachel again. You are going to. So you have this whole thing of that he goes, he ends up sort of befriending her a little bit and things go from there uh, where eventually he ends up introducing her to Earl as well the two of them talk about the fact that, that Greg and Earl make sort of little short spoofs of films that are sort of made by them um, and it's the whole thing of that while he's sort of there with Rachel who's going through leukemia and stuff like that and going through the um, uh, you know the treatment for that and things the I can't remember the, the name of it Chemotherapy. Uh, chemotherapy, that's it. I just couldn't think of the name. Um, while she's going through all that, he's then talking with her, and the whole thing is that one of their friends says that, I know what you've got to do for her. What you've got to do for Rachel is you need to make a film for her. Um, so it's then about you know him and Earl deciding this and trying to do that. And all the way through the film, it has these sequences where, as you get in these teen films, this kind of dramas where you have scenes where it stops and the character does some exposition and talks over, and that's fine. The thing about it is that it's got this real kind of heart to it and the performance from Thomas Mann is really good the performance from Olivia Cook is who plays Rachel is really really good as well um, and RJ RJ I'm not sure if it's Sila or Kyla is uh, plays Earl is really really good in the film so it's, it's really good sort of teen cast and performance um, and it's really impressive the fact of that I have to say 
I got really emotionally invested with this film. It's funny. It's got moments in it which are not laugh out loud funny, but little giggly bits and little bits of dialogue that are really well done. I'm not. I, I've no idea how accurate this is to the novel. I gotta guess that it is because it's written by the screenplay is written by the the, the writer of the novel. So it'll have the definitely the essence of it. And the thing is that it comes across really, really earnestly and really really you know we say about films that you really hate when there are films that are manipulative and try and get you to feel something for a film where you, you don't this actually isn't manipulative it's actually genuinely heartfelt in things that happen and such and you're going through events and you you start to care for the characters and uh, because they're real they're witty they're funny they're likable and it's got a, a good sense of this sort of trio in the drama there and it, it's I think really well done it's really well directed it's got this really interesting scene as well where there's some scenes that are in a, uh, just a room they're in a bedroom and there's three of them there and the camera is in the middle and it's just pivoting around between the three of them no cuts and it just it just goes back and forth it's like one person talks it, pin, it pans around quickly straight to the other person they talk and it pans around there and it's got some really nice visual techniques there as well which keep it visually interesting too so you never get bored of it you, uh, visually you, you're invested in the characters you've got great dialogue great cheesy moments in it which are intentionally cheesy and know it and work and i gotta say really really struck a chord with me and really really worked for me okay then we'll uh, quickly get on to no skip um uh, it, it stars Owen Wilson who plays uh, jack dwyer and at the start of the film we see him on a plane with his uh, wife and two children um, heading over to a new job in Southeast Asia where he, he works at. Uh... Hello. Hello. Okay, so we seem to be having a little bit of an internet connection issue thanks to our friendly things. Um, to Skype. Okay, we'll try and get Stuart back in a moment um, if not what I'll do is I'll go on because I have actually seen No Escape as well so I will go on tell this um, basically you have the, the whole family Dwyer's um, Jack Dwyer his wife Annie Dwyer played by Lake Bell and his two daughters who've arrived there uh, things sort of seem to be going well for him and normal and everything going fine until it does turn out there is an uprising going on and a coup going on with the military so you have this whole situation happening um, they are there and the whole thing is then that things kick off when uh, one morning after a pleasant night they've got there everything seems to be fine Jack goes out to get a newspaper finds himself in a street um, finds himself there with police and rioters um, and having to effectively run for his life to get back to the hotel and save himself and his family because all of the people from abroad you see in certain scenes are being shot and executed because of the fact of that he's there for this job to do with a, a water plant and it's all connected to foreigners and Americans coming in that has kind of enraged the local people. Uh, no idea exactly which clip this is because it was Stuart that set this up, but going to play the clip and you'll be able to hear a moment of that. The rebel leaders said we were trying to enslave their people by controlling the waterworks. And they were right. Most of those merciless men out there, they're just trying to protect their children, just like you. So don't thank me. I'm the one who puts your family in harm's way. The least I can do is get you out of the bloody place. So, yeah, fantastic, that isn't it? Brilliant mind, and it decides <laughs> to just go kaputski on it. So it's a good job that you've seen the film as well. So yeah. you're able to set up like... Yeah, I set up the clip. I, that clip, I didn't. I wasn't sure which clip it was because obviously there are sometimes more than one. Um, I didn't explain. Piers Brosnan is in the film as a guy who turns up there as well, and he has connections to them. And it turns out he is, as he said there in that clip, responsible for the things that have led to this happening and to the reasons why uh, foreigners in the country are basically being hunted down and killed. So I'll let you go back onto it though, because you were sort of reviewing it. So the, I've yeah. set up the story. <laughs> So, uh, as Andrew probably alluded to you uh, to there, it just everything goes from being pre like much uh, mundaneness, um, a family just moving, relocating from America to a different country, 
sort of like trying to establish themselves, realizing they've got no internet connection, they've got no television, just little tiny niggles. And it goes from there all the way into uh, a full scale war after he tries to buy a newspaper. And that's when things, the, the tone of the film completely changes. And to me, that's the problem with the film. The film itself is, is not bad, it's actually pretty decent. It's just the start of the film, the first 15, 20 minutes of it, makes you feel like it, it's a 12 year movie. You start to get into the film thinking to yourself, could this actually be a 15 in a way? It, it, it's trying to maybe sort of water itself down a little bit, cut some scenes back, and it's possible this could end off like a Taken kind of film, where it, it's intentionally a 15, but they've cut some stuff down to make it a 12 year. Then when the film gets into the part where the family itself is on the run, they have to try and survive, that's when you start to see some, some of the brutal nature of the film. You start to see people getting killed by machetes, and there is a nasty scene which involves... You, you don't get to see it. You just get the setup of the scene, but involves four people getting run over. And so that's when the film starts to become a 15, and so... It masquerades between being a 12 and a 15, and it's really difficult to find out where it's it is proper. A, I think actually, is it, is it not a 15? It is 15 rated, though, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Just I'm just trying to clear that out, because you get films that are 15 that can be 12s, you get films that are 12s that are 15, but still manage to get away with being a 12. This actually is a 15, though. It definitely is a 15, yeah, because I, I was wondering what the, um, the classification of it is. So it does know where it uh, wants to land. Like I said, that's not to say that film is bad because it's not. Um, Owen Wilson is fine in the film. Everybody is is fine. Nobody shines. Pierce Brosnan is introduced at the start of the film. He's then alluded to slightly um, during some of the the nastiest scenes when they're trying to escape, and then he uh, reappears again near to the end of the film to try and tie up the main plot point of the movie. But it, it also feels like the main plot point of the film seems to be forced because they need to make the film have this sort of like thrilling on your edge seat kind of feel to it. And the reason why they've done that, the, the whole reason for that edge of the seat thing is to add this white element to it. And that feels slightly forced into the film as well. So there's stuff in the film which drags it back a little bit and it stops it from being an interesting movie. But we have seen films this year which tries to copy this kind of blueprint and feel badly because it doesn't realise where to go with most of the tone of the film. This one, even though it has problems with that, it still handles itself better than some of the ones that we have seen this year. So it's not like a film you need to rush out and see and you'll be on the edge of the seat from the start, of the, uh, to, from the start all the way to the end. That won't happen. You will find problems with it. But it, it's a movie where it will pass the 100-minute running time. And we're fine. And you'll come out of the cinema thinking, yeah, okay, that, that, was, that, that was fine. I want to just mention as well because it's it's been a big point that they've made in the adverts and the trailers and everything that there are these scenes which are I actually found them quite nerve wracking and they were almost I wouldn't say quite knuckle white knuckling but seriously tense scenes in it because there is a great well handled scene that the only problem I have with it is when it uses slow motion because that tends to come in at the wrong times but there's scenes to do with when they're on a roof there are people coming about to kill them and the only way the thing they can do is to get across to the next building which involves literally picking up his children and throwing them across to his wife once she's already jumped over there and i will say this that scene did get me on edge of it i will say th- I, I do think it's got some seriously tense scenes which are well set up and well well sort of uh choreographed and well put together yeah, I just wish that um, directors wouldn't you overuse slow motion in films as a, a yeah. thing to establish tension because it doesn't work. It takes you out of the movie. So, yeah, yeah it, it's okay. Okay, that's it for this week's releases. Uh, we're going to take a quick break, after which we're back with this week's home release section. So stick around and we'll be back in just a moment. But from page to screen, to screen. So they have nine times out of ten, they have to send it back to you unopened, or just throw it in the garbage can. Things don't always look exactly as we envision our life to look, but sometimes it works out and turns out even better. Gregor Fisher, his bacon number is two because he was uh, appeared with January Jones in Love Actually, and January Jones and Kevin Bacon appeared in X Men First Class together. I've got to say, the very Harold and Kumar 3D Christmas. Now that. 
just <laughs> makes me want to rush out. It's about the acting and about the writing. That's really what theatre is for me. Probably had more names than uh, than Prince or whatever. <laughs> Never mind, there's a joke for the oldies. Um, oh, it'd be like, who's Prince? Who's oh. he? I'd just like to see uh, Mr. Freeze hiring his bad guys going, right, okay, so you're a psycho, right, can you ice skate? Head over to iTunes, Spreaker and Stitcher and put in the search box from page to screen. And welcome back to this week's Monday Movie Show, into the home release sections, where we haven't got very many films to have a look at, but we do have one big, important movie. Yep, we have um, the what was potentially going to be a complete disaster of a film, because of events we'll get to, Fast and Furious 7, um, and then we have a small indie kind of horror film, which has been a bit of a surprise, I have to admit, um, in Unfriended. You have um, a weird kind of... Uh, it's, it's not really a horror, is it? But it's a thriller sort of thing, isn't it? it, um, it just, Final it, Girl. It's a very strange movie. Yeah, it's. Um, I haven't seen it, but I've known bits of it. it it's a uh, Final Girl. We have uh, John Travolta in a straight-to-video drama with The Forger. Uh, we have Horror with Demonic. And then wrapping up things with a, a late addition to this show, because we weren't sure we were going to be able to see it in time, but... Um, ending out things with a royal night out. Yeah, and on top of that, we have our TV movie of the week, but we'll start things off with the Blu ray and DVD top 10. Yep, starting at number 10 with Insurgent. Yeah, um, the Mayor's Run of Scotch Trials is out in the cinemas on Thursday of this week. We'll be reviewing it on next week's show. And I've got a feeling that that's going to supersede the Insurgent Divergent series because um, because of Insurgent, it's dragged Divergent down a lot. Now, um, it, it, that. Divergent was a really well-made film. It, it set up the series really, really well. It's just annoying that the sequel is sort of like took away a lot of the brilliance that Divergent created. It, it's a very lacklustre um, sequel. Yeah. Say note about the Maze Runner. It's currently at number forty-three in the chart. What do you reckon it's going to be in the top ten next week? It, it's actually in the chart. It's in the chart. Is it number forty-three? Oh, the original Maze Runner. Um, yep. I think it'll probably be actually quite up there. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if it jumps into the top ten. It's a film that I I quite enjoyed, and so I'm looking forward to the next one. I, and I actually have to say, I think the film, the first one, definitely does improve better. It does a better job than Insurgent does. I don't know about Divergent, but definitely Insurgent. Yeah. Uh, number nine is Interstellar, just jumping up from 20-odd places to number nine. My guess it's probably down to the fact that it might be selling quite cheap now, because um, at the moment it's getting shown on Sky Movies, so that's maybe the reason why it's selling quite cheap. But yeah, it's a really well-made film for the first two thirds. It's just the ending is a re- a bit of a mess. It just doesn't feel like it belongs to the film that it's created, and I didn't think that the the father daughter relationship was that strong in the film. Uh, number eight, also jumping back straight up the chart from uh, last week, apparently number forty to number eight, the theory of everything. Yeah, I wonder if this is down to Eddie, Eddie Redmayne's new film that comes out on um, New Year's Day. The one who uh, it's from the director of um, the King's Speech. I can't remember the name of the film. Um, um, it's not, it, I, I've it, not seen it I don't know about that so you're he plays a transgender uh, person the Danish girl that's it yeah, he plays, uh, yeah he plays a transgender person a person who's in a relationship with a woman who's played by Alicia Vikander and he starts to realise he, he's more interested in being a woman rather than being a relationship one so I wonder if it's because people are starting to they saw the, the trailer for that and thought well, the theory of everything is Eddie Redmayne's latest film, so why don't we just get by, by that instead of Jupiter Ascending? So, if it's if it's as good a performance as it gives in the theory of everything, then it will be justified for being from interesting. What, from what I've read, um, the Guardian had an early review of the film, and because it was shown at a, um, a film festival, they thought it was a not very good. Oh, they thought okay. Eddie Redmayne's performance was really well. They just felt like it was one of those movies that was crying out for an Oscar. That, that, that was forcing itself to be Oscar beard. Talking of not very good, at number seven is home. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> we, 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 we've said everything we can about them. Home, I slightly stick up for it, and he doesn't. Yeah, how often does that happen? Very rare. <laughs> uh, number six is Child 44. 
Yeah, we're both not going to agree with this. Um, uh, agree that the fact that this film is any good because it's not. It's got a good premise. It's got some really good actors in it. It just doesn't have a good film in it. Uh, number five is Fifty Shades of Grey. Yeah, I think a movie that doesn't have anything good to it at all. Um, new entries now coming up for the next few. And number four is Monsters Dark Continent. Pointless sequel. The the first one got the the feel the, the sort of like the fact that they didn't use the monsters as as its um, anchor. It used the relationship between the two characters and the monsters was sort of like the background kind of stuff. When it introduced the monsters into the film, that's where the tension started to arise a lot more. So this one feels like two action films sewn together, for completely from two different movies as well. You've got one where it's. Um, these guys going into a war-torn place to try and rescue some soldiers and then all of a sudden it's the soldiers that have been rescued and survived against a, an attack going across country to try and survive against these monsters. So it's two different films and both of them are just badly executed. And number three is Far From The Madding Crowd. You liked this more than I did. I found there was slight problems and I felt the film itself sagged a lot in, in, this, in the middle part of the movie. I also felt like even though it built up the female performances of the movie, it was knocking it down quicker than it could build them back up again. But it, it was still very well acted by Carrie Mulligan. I, I thought she was fantastic. Matthias Schoenert is also really good in it. Their relationship is the, the linchpin of the film, is the strength of the film. Introducing the other two characters, which are, involve a love triangle, that, that's where the film starts to disintegrate a lot more. Um, a new entry as well for a straight to video version now it's not the, it's not the movie Legend which comes out on this Wednesday it is instead though another story about the craze Rise of the Craze which looks really bad I've seen trailers of it and it looks a lot like those Rise of the Foot Soldiers movies which by the way there's a fourth one of them coming out in a couple of weeks time oh. so uh, yeah I know I know Stuart Bannerman who does uh, from page to screen champions these movies and I think he must have seen about 60, 70 British gangster films they're all exactly the same. None of them feel different. All of them are badly acted and all of them are boring. Uh, which means that the number one film has held the top spot from last week. It's Cinderella. That's because people are still buying it for the Frozen shot. You can just imagine if the Frozen shot was released on DVD on its own. That would be number one for the next ten years. Mm. But yes, yeah, Cinderella, it, it, I, I don't suggest you watch it because it's just a, re a complete retelling of the original 1940s animated classic rather than a reimagining of it mm. well I do want to see it I just haven't had a chance I'm interested because it is Kenneth Branagh but I just I I'm I have trepidations now because of what I've heard yeah Lily Collins is really good at Cinderella uh, Kate Blanchett is the the stepmother she's fantastic she just um, goes along with it. She's uh, she's opulent in the dresses that she wears, and she absolutely loves the character. And so those two are the shining light of the film. It's just the fact that Kenneth Branagh decided to do a like for like remake. You as, as well, you realize as well that's Lily Collins has played both now Snow White and Cinderella. And I think as she handles that sort of like princess kind of queen look brilliantly, she mm. has that ethereal kind of quality to her, very much like Marilyn Manson in a way. <laughs> okay, uh, let's go and move on. We get, uh, we've got several films to get through. The biggest one of which this week is yours, so take it away. Yeah, Fast and Furious 7, directed by James Wan, who cuts his teeth on horror films. Uh, we'll get on to a James Wan film a little bit later on. But in this time, he's decided to throw his horror cat away for a little bit to direct the seventh entry in the Fast and Furious franchise. And this was the film that was noted because of the fact that um, one of the main actors in Paul Walker passed away during filming of the of the film itself uh, in a car accident. And so for the rest of the shoot of the film, they got some of his brothers in to replace him. They did some CGI touch-ups with that as well. And so the film itself has been constantly dedicated to um, to Paul Walker. And this, in a way, when you watch the film, the story takes a bit of a backseat because you're more concentrating on pretty much his final hurrah, he, his final film. Because when you watch the film for um, a second or third or fourth time, you realise how the film is actually directed around the incident that, that occurred with Paul Walker. But the basic story is after after the stuff that's happened in Fast and Furious 6 with, um, with Owen Shaw... Um, Shaw's brother, Deckard Shaw, who's played by uh, Jason Statham, 
he's um, decided to seek retribution for the death of his brother. Or the well, at the start of the film, you see him in a hospital bed. You don't know if he's dead, but he looks pretty much uh, close to death. And so he's seeking retribution of that. And so the whole idea for that is him to trek across the world to hunt down every single member of um, Dominic Toretto's group to try and eliminate them. And so we see scenes where you see at the end, if you saw the last little snippet at the end of the sixth film, one of the characters was involved in a car accident. You've also got the fact that a package gets sent to uh, Dominic Toretto, which involves an explosion at um, Brian O'Connor's, played by Paul Walker's house, and so forces his family to go into hiding. So it's up to them to try and track down Deckard to try and stop him. Interleaved into that, though, you've got this interesting chip which is an able, able to find somebody on the planet, anywhere on the planet, using things like mobile phones and security cameras and stuff. So an agent decides to, to get the, the group together to tell them, if you help us out trying to track this chip down, we'll help you out by giving you control of this chip to try and track down um, Deckard and for you to stop him. Here's a clip. So let me get this straight. There's only one road that leads in or out. Sheer drops on every side. A motorcade from hell protected by a small army from one mile in either direction? Yeah, that's about it. You done? No, I'm not done. So you all wanted me to break into a police station? Fine. Then you asked me to stop a tank. I wasn't happy about it, but I did it. Then you came up with this brilliant idea to shoot down one of the largest airplanes ever. I shot that out the sky. Mm. It's nothing. But this right here, my friend, happens to be the stupidest idea I've ever heard of in my life. I, I forgot that you were the only one to bring the plane down. No, no. The only thing I've ever seen him take down was uh, Noni's Denise. Remember? At prom? Really, Brian? Yeah. You gonna do that right here? So y'all trying to get me off my point. Now, when the film came out in cinemas, my biggest problem with the movie is that um, the scattergun effect that happens in the first half of the film. Because there's so many story strands for Deckard to try and sort of like destroy the uh, Toretto's group. There's so many of them for him to be involved with that the film just felt like it was just a quick set piece after set piece. It felt like a music video was stitched together. Now, in the last half of the film, you've got the group together working properly together again to try and stop Deckard. Now, <coughs> you have to excuse my voice. Um... I've, I've seen, seen the film. The time. I know, but it's even <laughs> worse. It's been I couldn't help it. You let, you let that one open, sorry. It's been like this for the last four <laughs> weeks, and I don't know when it's going to end, so I, I struggled speaking for a long period of time. But I, I've seen the film multiple times since I've seen it in the cinema, and my problem still stands with the first half of the film. It, it is slightly messy the way it's handled. When the film gets its act together in the last... I would say more than third it is the last half of the film that's when it starts when they start to become like a group that's when the film fully works and that begins in this huge massive tower where they're, they're going after this this um, this chip known as God's Eye inside of a car and you see that really brilliantly uh, executed set piece where you see the car jump between three buildings that's when the film starts to become a Fast and Furious movie that's when the film starts to become a group film, and that's when the film works. The previous stuff is, I think it's just set up for the last half of the film. Obviously, we're, we're falling then into the territory of seeing Paul Walker's final hurrah, and we've seen how it plays out, because if you've seen the music video, the last little section of the film is in that, and it's not spoiling it at all, because it's been absolutely everywhere, and that's handled with such elegance, with such brilliance, uh, the weird, you have to give credit to James Wan for the way he directed it, and also the credit to every single of the act, every single one of the actors involved in it, because you, you just don't know how you would react to losing a friend like that, or as uh, Vin Diesel says, as, as Don, Dominic Toretto, a brother, because that's how we treat Paul Walker during the, the whole of the Fast and Furious franchise, the ones that they, they were involved in together. So the final hurrah is very emotional. It, 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 on multiple viewings, it still gets you. But the film itself, it's not the best Fast and Furious film. I still think, in my opinion, that's five. I agree. But it, it, it's still really... It, the last part, 
had elements of it being the best Fast and Furious movie and if one managed to handle the last part and transport that into the first bit as well, made a whole film like that, the film would have probably been the best in the series. But because of the, the lackluster first half of the film, it, it's, it's still really well executed with problems. I don't have the same problem with you do as you do with the first half of the film. I do have a little bit of a problem with actually with the last half when it does kick up things a bit because as much as you do have it's a big blockbuster thing and it's an action thing as well. You do have these scenes as it gets more and more a little bit sort of more and more bit ridiculous as something goes on which is more I think more Hollywoodized than it has been before any of the films in the franchise even with the fifth one with the events towards the end of that but it's still a film that's it's amazing the fact that that it managed to pull everything together as it did given the events that happened with Paul Walker and the fact of that not only did they manage to make a a competent film and a story that everything that worked but they managed to make one that actually is one you really enjoy and you get into it and it lives up to the Fast and Furious name. It's it's not, as you say, the the best one of them all, but it's far from being anywhere near the worst or even a mediocre one. It's it's actually a really solid action film that is worthy of your time. And I mean, it's it is obviously a Hollywood big block, blockbuster action film, but it does still have the whole thing of the characters in there and and that which is a kind of I think one of the things that actually makes it work more and, and has been why it's got such a following because you do have this kind of feeling of family between the characters so I think it's definitely a worthy sequel I think it's better than the last one I think it's better than Fast and Furious 6 but I agree the fifth one is the best one because of just how that managed to change things up a little bit um, but I, I'm glad to have had this as part of the series because I I do enjoy these films I love this series and it means that as much as maybe all franchises at some point should end, they're doing another one. If they can keep it at this level, as they're showing that they can do, I have no problem whatsoever with there being another film. Yeah, um, you have to give also credit to the fact that, even though there are scenes of dancing girls and stuff like that, this never talks down to women. Um, you've got um, some women who's really kicking bottom in this. Ronda Rousey <laughs> It's a perfect person to get if you want a fight scene, Michelle Rodriguez really knows how to handle herself as well. And the way they've actually created a character in the last two films, it is very well done. And so the, um, it, it never talks down to women. Even if you look at Jordan Brewster, she's sort of like the one who looks from the outside in. She realizes what Toretto is doing and um, the fact that the pull of what Connor um, Brian O'Connor has and uh, on the group as well and he needs to be involved with them she realised that, she never drags him down yet you've also got the emotional anchor with her as well there's a fantastic emotional scene, just a tiny little scene which involves both of them two saying I love you on the phone to each other and it's very poignant the way that scene is played out and it's nice to have little elements of that in the film, sort of like scenes which calm stuff down a lot and so it never talks down to women. The series has never done that. Yeah, you, like I said, you've got the typical woman who drops the flags for the cars to go past really fast. And Iggy Azalea, who you just want to smack in the face with a shovel because she's really annoying. But he, it still has very strong women characters in the film. Okay, on to the next film, which is um, it's a small little horror film called Cybernatural, um, as it was called um, in America and some things. But it's, the the title it was given here is Unfriended. It was also um, called Unfriended in America. It was originally was it, called Cybernatural, it but they changed oh, okay. the name. I thought it was actually Cybernatural there. Yeah, okay, I stand corrected on that. Um, it is a film which basically all takes place on one screen. Um, and that may seem a bit weird, but I'll explain. It's basically, it is essentially it's a Skype movie it's a movie which um, is to told from the point of view of the the main character who is she's basically Laura is the, the character played by Heather Sossman um, she is talking to uh, several of her friends all at the same time all on video chat so all of their screens pop up as well as whenever you're on video chat you get the little screen of yours as well so that's how we see her as well as seeing all of them weird things start to happen when there are sort of things going on connected to it being a year ago that a girl that they knew 
had actually killed herself. Um, this being the anniversary of that, when they're in the chat, all of a sudden someone else joins the chat with the you know the logo that has no face or anything to it. Just says this is an account. Unable to get rid of this person, the lot of them are sort of having their chat and thinking what's going on. When all of a sudden the person is start, sort of starts sending chat messages to them and all these things going on and they start to investigate and look into things while well, this is going all these weird things going on they find out this account used to be this dead girl's account I don't have a clip for this because it's hard to find any clips for it but um, basically I'm going to say the thing of that I don't like horror films I generally don't like them not my sort of thing I did go and see this at the cinema and I was surprised to say I actually did enjoy it I thought it wasn't brilliant but I thought it was competently handled. It does have some issues. It has some of the horrible jump cut things. It has the horrible thing as well of telegraphing when there is going to be some kind of tension thing happening. Instead of actually knowing how to build tension, all they do is turn up the bass. It's all about that bass. All about oh, that God, bass. No, about please, that no, stop, about stop, that bass. Stop, That's as stop. far as it is in this film, yeah. That's basically what it is. It's whenever they're going to have that, you just have the base starts building and building and building, and then bang, something happens. And it's a nice setup, but the thing is that I got to say, the thing that does sell it and the thing that actually does create some tension is that there are these six actors that are all unknown actors, not seen in anything before, um, and yet they really do bring tension to their scenes and the stress of them and that going on, and, and you believe their performances and what's going on with them and everything and uh, well you may not you're giggling there but i thought that their performances were really good and it actually really worked for me in so much so that i i got into it and i was genuinely impressed because of the fact of that it's a simple idea it's done in that way and it managed to keep me entirely held with it and captivated if anything by the performances yeah i'm gonna sort of like throw a, a spanner in the works there a little bit uh, the film itself was actually shot on GoPro cameras. It wasn't all shot on Skype. Um, it was oh, made no, to look it was, like it was Skype. Yeah, it was made to look like that, but it was done. Which is, it, is a, it is a Skype film, though, basically. It's, it's all that's yeah. the setting of it. But it, which is brilliantly well edited together for a film that was all shot on GoPro cameras made to look like Skype because that, that's a really difficult thing to do and the weird at fast cuts it is fantastically edited together. So you've got to give plaudits to the way the film is cut as... Um, the actors shot their scenes separate from each other as well. So they, they didn't, they, they only saw the reactions from the videos that they were watching of their friends, what they shot. So they shot the film in order, but it was shot like that. So again, well done to the actors, well done to the editing. There are a couple of scenes, there is one really gah kind of moment because you don't expect it, um, which I, I really liked. And the film itself is slightly more intelligent than the trailer makes it out to be. And as a horror film, I actually liked it. I, I thought it was a very well implemented and very well created horror film. Yeah, um, I agree. Final Girl. It's directed by Tyler Shields. Very simple premise. It stars Abigail Breslin and Wes Bentley. Abigail Breslin is a, an unknown aged teenage girl who's sort of being trained by Wes Bentley's character to look after herself. You don't know if she's an agent, if she's a clone, if she's a robot or anything like that. Just somebody who's been trained up by this to stop bad guys. And so um, Wes Bentley's character discovers that there's this group of lads who are in this small town who have an attraction to blonde-haired girls, take them out to the forest and kill them. And so they decide to take it onto themselves to set these lads up so uh, Breslin's character can stop them. Here's a clip. How many? How many what? How many girls have they killed? Ten. Maybe a dozen. And another local girl, Gwen Thomas, went missing a few days ago. One of them has a girlfriend. Why does that surprise you? They just don't seem to like women. They don't like anybody, really. Incapable of empathy. But they can fake it. 
And so th the premise of the film is, is very straightforward, unlike the way the film is actually played out, because it has a very noirish kind of twisted, weird feel to it. It's not noirish in the style that we know uh, a film noir, but it, it has that kind of feel to it. And she's got this these character traits where she seems to be very like childlike and then all of a sudden being able to handle herself by flipping a switch and the film itself is very weird i it's quite well acted by abigail breslin it's just the, the way the the movie is executed it just makes you scratch your head thinking to yourself what the hell is going on here because it's not one of those mind trip kind of movies it's just a film which just you, you go what Okay, fine. That that scene. Okay, she's what? And because the the kids that 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 she's trying to stop these people who were who are killing these blonde girls, you don't find out why they're doing it. And she's able to actually make them hallucinate and see um, rabbits, big, huge, massive, giant rabbits, or people in clown outfits, or things like that. It, it, it's just really weird. Um, so it's a movie if you want to see something very strange and Abigail Breslin, she's a really good actor so that's a plus side to it but if you're, if you're after a bit of a strange thriller then this is probably a film for you because it will just make you want to rinse out your, your head a little bit because it made my brain hurt slightly by the end of it Okay, um, The Forger which is directed by Philip Martin it is a film which stars John Travolta as uh, Raymond Cutter, a man who is a um, art forger, who, as we start the movie, is in prison. He's still got ten months to go on a, a four-year stint. Um, he is, though, um, instead of waiting those ten months as he sort of should, and everyone's in, everyone suggests to him, he organises and makes contact with someone outside, who basically bribes a judge for fifty thousand uh, dollars to get him on his parole. Uh, the reason for that is that his son has been diagnosed with an operable cancer um, and so he's basically come out of prison to try and spend time with his son and deal with that. Uh, the, the consequences of though making the deal with this uh, person outside is that he has to um, do an art forgery for them and also steal a successful piece of art, a, a very famous piece of art and basically swap, swap it out so that this person can then sell this art on to someone else who's requested it for them. So he finds himself in this hole while all the time sort of dealing with the fact of that his father played by Christopher Plummer is there and his son played by Ty Sheridan um, who is not the sort of the best relationship between any three of them um, and he's trying to sort of deal with the issue of having to deal with this forgery stuff while also dealing with his son and the whole situation of that where it kind of sets up this thing going around doing a bucket list sort of thing. Um, the film is um, really, it is straight to video for a reason because it's that kind of level. Unfortunately, it's not a very well that well handled film. It's very, very average. There's nothing in particular that outstands, that's outstanding about it that's, that really makes it a point. It's surprising considering that you managed to get John Travolta in it and Christopher Plummer. Christopher Plummer is doing his best but he's not really got a lot to work with Ty Sheridan is perfectly fine in it but nothing fantastic um, and Ty Sheridan we have seen sort of do better in his roles before we've seen him um, the film that we saw him in uh, was uh, Joe and Mud which I absolutely loved him in that because Mud was a complete standout film for me um, and here it's just an average performance because it's just an average film it does have this weird thing of that it doesn't know if it wants to be a thriller or if it wants to be a drama. It kind of is trying to do the both. And as I say, normally you try and do two things, you try and serve two masters, you can't do both, you end up doing neither. Unfortunately, that goes for this film. It doesn't manage to be a successful thriller, it doesn't manage to be a successful drama. It has its foot in both worlds and really can't decide which one it wants to step into fully. Um, demonic. Directed by Will Cannon and produced by James Wan. So James Wan crops up for a second time on this week's show. Um, it's uh, pretty much one of these teen horror films. It centers around a detective who's played by Frank Grillo, who's called to uh, attend a call at this house where three bodies have been found dead. One survivor there, um, John, who's played by Dustin Milligan. And he's asked to go through the story of what's happening. So um, John recounts the fact that him... 
and a group of friends has gone into this house where an incident happened. The original owner of the house tried to summon a demon um, and slaughter people inside this house, but it ultimately went wrong. They tried to summon the spirit of this woman, and again, things went wrong. And so it's up to the detective with the help of another um, uh, sort of like an interrogator who's played by Maria Bello to discover what's, what actually went on in this house using the video footage from the kids that, that they shot. So the film, like I said, it's very typical James Wan in a way. Area. It's very much um, like The Conjuring. It's, it's got a lot of feel to that. The house, I think, was the same house that The Conjuring was shot in, if I remember correctly. And you can tell that. And James Wan has a knack of doing these kind of horror films, um, whether he produces them or directs them. Because he, he has an eye for horror. He has a detail for horror. He knows how to pace the scene really well and not rely on these stupid, quiet, quiet bang moments. He does that sometimes, but he doesn't overly rely on that. And the only other director I can think of who does that is Ty West. Ty West loves to build up these movies and then ultimately makes the last 20 minutes of it where you're just so much on your edge, you, you fall off your seat multiple times. James Wan doesn't do that, but he's able to build up tension and have a little bit at the end of that tension that he builds up, so he does it in pockets. And that's what Demonic sort of feels like. It's not like up there with one's best films, but it still has a feel of um, of uh, that, that James Wan has got some kind of involvement with it. It has a few nice little twists here and there. Um, the feel and style of the house is very well done. The kids aren't annoying, which is a, a plus because normally in this kind of film, the kids, the teenagers, that get there, they just want to tell them to shut up and be slaughtered by the demon. And the film, it flows really well. And so it, as a direct-to-DVD movie, it got a theatrical release in the US. It, it's actually not bad. Okay, the final film of the evening is A Royal Night Out, which is directed by Julian Gerald. It is um, a... Well, it, it's a case of... It's a weird one. It's a case of whether or not you believe it is based on true events or whether or not it's fictional, based around true events uh, that possibly could have happened. Never really known for sure, but um, I'll let you maybe decide from that, from what I explain what happens. Basically, in 1945, um, on VE Day, Victory Europe Day, when the, at the end of World War II, uh, Princess Elizabeth and Princess Margaret um, basically are sort of well pushing to see if they can get out in amongst all of the crowds of people kind of incognito and not be seen amongst them but to sort of be out there and just basically go out have fun and have a good night out without being people aware that they are the princesses um, of course their parents uh, you have the queen and the king are against this uh, queen elizabeth played by emily watson and king george played by rupert everett um, who are very much against this um, and so obviously overrule this idea uh, the two sisters though princess margaret played by belle powley and a princess elizabeth played by sarah gaydon have other ideas here's a clip is considered by those deep in the know to be the best club west of Piccadilly. Barely a bar full of us throw from carriages, just around the corner from the American Embassy. Margaret. Mr. Gregory Peck was there only last week, drinking martinis and dancing. <laughs> Which one is there to be in? The Lindy Hop. Come on, Bumblefoot. I'll show you. One, two, three, four. Margaret. And... Mickey tells me there's going to be a wizard all night at Chelsea Barracks. One of his friends gave him the password. Would they let me in, do you think? I think so. Being a princess. Just being you would do it. Really? The best nightclub in all of Mayfair. Mummy said no. What kind of no? No as in absolutely not under any circumstances whatsoever. Of course, though, they do manage to get them talk out of it, and they go out. They're given chaperones in the form of two uh, lieutenants that are sort of set up to be taken with them. Um, things, of course, though, don't go well for the two lieutenants who are left behind somewhere, and the princesses essentially run amok out in amongst the crowds travelling around London. Um, the film is... Well, let's put it this way. It's just bizarrely odd and completely nutbar it's a question of whether or not you can believe it happened and if not you know 
it's the whole thing of that and the thing is it does kind of work on that level you kind of go well you know what i'll run with it and it's okay i didn't think it was as amazing as i've heard a lot of people say it was really really good funny film I have to say, I watched it, I enjoyed it, but I didn't find it really that funny, as a lot of people, I think, have made it out to be, in the trailer, definitely made it out to be funnier, as usually is the case. I did enjoy it, as I say, but I, for, for me, it just, for some things of it, just didn't quite gel, didn't quite work, it felt a little bit forced, it felt a little bit like it, it could have been better and improved upon, and maybe been a little bit sort of hasty with some of the things it does I, I wish that it had been maybe taking a little bit of time with some more scenes because it feels awfully rushed with there's some scenes that, that things happen then they move on to next scene and next scene and next scene and just to try and cram in as many things kind of happening in the night whereas it would have been nicer if it had slowed down a little bit and taken its time at some parts because it's not even as if it's an especially long film it is only uh, an hour and 30 odd minutes so you could have had a little bit more time in it i'm not saying you know it had to be a longer film but i think maybe just a bit of reorganization of things and if it had been a little bit planned out more in a better way it would have been a better film as it stands it's perfectly fine nothing wrong with it some people may find themselves hard to go along with it and believe it but it's okay i didn't think it's as fantastic as it could have been though right that's it for the new releases of this week um, TV movies of the week I've actually got quite a lot um, I've got some for most nights actually um, going through Tuesday Wednesday I know it's cheating but i got Tuesday Wednesday Thursday Saturday and Sunday and they're all good films you know what? I've only choose, chosen two when they were on Saturday and Sunday so they're probably two that you've already got Okay, well, uh, Tuesday night the 8th at 9 o'clock on Film 4, The Angel's Share, which is a brilliant drama in Scotland, set in Scotland, and around a bunch of characters that are unemployed and decide to basically go on a heist. Um, and it's actually oh, whiskey. really... Yeah, and it's actually pretty damn funny. Um, you have it is really the, funny. Inglorious Bar Stewards, as we call it on this show. Um, Quentin Tarantino's uh, World War Two. Uh, mishmash of things um, but a really good film uh, film 4 again, most of these are film 4 um, Wednesday the 9th of September at 9 o'clock Watchmen, which is Zack Snyder's big comic book epic comic book adaptation so expect that to be on for quite a while because it's on at 10.50pm on film 4 on Thursday the 10th it will probably finish at some time around about 2 o'clock in the morning given adverts will be added to it um, Saturday and Sunday. Now, Saturday at 11.20 p.m.? Nope. Nope. Uh, Seven Psychopaths, which is uh, the follow-up to In Bruges, and I think a successor to In Bruges, better than In Bruges, um, on Film 4. And Sunday, I think this is probably the same one, you've got 11.30 p.m.? Nope. Nope, on Channel 4. Uh, the Place Beyond the Pines. Okay. Well, there are two I've got in the clash with your last two, so uh, brilliant. Okay. Um, but out of that lot there, which one would you choose? You can only choose uh, one of them. Uh, what, what are your two, actually? Well, uh, my two are on Channel 4 at 10 past 11 on Saturday the 12th is Chronicle, uh, when Josh Trank sort of like had his leash on and uh, written by Max Landis. Really well-made film. Not a found footage film. It is a film. It's not because the footage is never found. It's lost in the <laughs> Alps. No, Himalayas. That's where it's left. So the footage is never found. But it's a really well-constructed uh, movie. Dean DeHaan, that he sort of like brought him to the forefront, uh, their film. And he's gone off to do multiple brilliant films. It's a film that, he, that he's in, which is in about a month's time, which looks really good. And the other one, and this is the one I would choose for my TV movie of the week, is on film four. 25 past 11 on Sunday the 13th, Tyrannosaur, uh, directed by Paddy Constantine, Constantine um, starring Peter Mullen and Olivia Colman. Brutal film, but absolutely superbly acted. Brilliantly directed as well. It was Paddy Constantine's directorial debut. And it I was did see that there. Yeah, it was brilliantly well handled, brilliantly well acted. It's just, like I said, it's a brutal film. It's a very hard watch. But if you can I, stick through it, I would definitely recommend it. 
I did see that there, and I would have possibly chosen that, except for the fact I still haven't seen it yet. And the thing is, you're going to really hate me for it, is I have the DVD sitting around somewhere as well. So <laughs> I yeah, really I, should have seen it by now. It's not one of those movies where you go and you look at your collection and go, oh, I think I'll watch Tyrannosaur, because you need to be in the proper frame of mind to watch mm. it, because it is such a really hard movie to watch, especially what happens to Olivia Colman's character throughout the film. But it's superbly acting. It's it, it, it just an outstanding. One of the best British films of the last 10 years. Not on the same level, but I think out of mine, what I will go for is Watchmen on Thursday night the 10th at 10.50pm on Film 4. Because I do love that film. And I think it's a, it is a great epic film. It's got this epic feel to it. And it's it has got a great direction from Zack Snyder and a great sense of visual style to it as well. So that's it for this week's show. And make sure you visit the website, mondaymovieshow.co.uk. You can leave us feedback in multiple forms, either on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash mondaymovieshow, on Twitter at mondaymovieshow. I'm there at Cryptic Tadpole. Andrew's there at EHDVD. Also email us, mondaymovieshow at yahoo.com. Um, leave us feedback on the speaker page and on the multiple um, uh, Android apps and iTunes as well. Before we disappear, what is your movie of the week? Uh, me and Earl and the Dying Girl. Um, I would have to, to cop out slightly and go with Fast and Furious 7, but it, I would make it a double bill between that and Unfriended because I did actually really like Unfriended, so none of the cinema releases, even though I thought No Escape was fine. I, I think Fast and Furious 7 and Unfriended make a better viewing. Yeah. I'm really surprised uh, that with the American Ultra, I, I, when I was looking at it and everything, I was thinking, I'm going to love American Ultra. Nope. Nope. So, like I said, that's it for this week's show. We'll be back um, sometime next week, either Sunday, Monday or next week, but you'll find details on the site. Hopefully, it'll be up much more quicker than it was this week. I just had so many computer problems that my head hurt by yeah, the end of... Hopefully, uh, we'll not so have so many problems next week, touch wood. Yeah, I think it was just because <laughs> we were reviewing Unfriended this week, and so our computers decided to just <laughs> cave in on us. But, yeah, we'll clear you out with a clip for what film? Legend. So a legend is out on Wednesday. Tom Hardy plays both the Korea twins. Remember, it was, there were two different types of people, so it's two different uh, full-on roles that he's had to take on in the film. And early indications here that the film itself is a bit lackluster, but his performance is fantastic. You'll find out your thoughts on next week's show. So until next week, goodbye. Bye bye. Look around you. Look down the block from you. Come on, hurry up. The lonely faces that you see. Esmeralda's barn made money like a dream. £2,000 a week, pure profit. There was nothing to do but enjoy it. Owning that casino meant everything to Reggie. He'd finally crossed the line between the old East End and the green pastures of the Golden West. He was becoming a celebrity himself. As long as their health didn't suffer, the high rollers loved rubbing elbows with gangsters. Come on, don't you? Come on, don't you? Aristocrats and criminals have a lot in common. They're both selfish, get bored easily, and have access to wads of cash they didn't have to work honestly to get. The topper neither have any interest in bourgeois rules or morality. Put it all together with roulette wheels, a stunning recipe for success. Ron was the odd man out. His pills stabilised him, but they'd never cure him. Clubland held little charm, and he yearned for Reggie and the darker side of gangland. As soon as you turn him back, life plays dirty tricks on you, you know?